The, the topic of this session is uh, PPH. Of course, uh, this is uh, one of the major practice in, uh, in our uh, daily activities as a urologist. And uh, we know a lot about the new trends in the treatment of PPH, starting from traditional TERP up to uh, arterial embolization, and etc. So we'll start uh, by the first speaker, um, Dr. Mitchell Humphreys, uh, will tell us his thoughts and experience about lasers in treatment of BPH, please. Thank you very much for having me. And again, I want to thank the uh, scientific committee and the program committee for inviting us. Last night was a wonderful evening. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the hospitality, so I wanted to first start out by saying thank you. Today, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the different lasers in BPH and the roles. And unfortunately, when we start talking about um, lasers and whatnot, we have to discuss a little bit of physics about how they work, because that's going to help you make a decision on what's right for you. So lasers aren't new to urology. They've been around for over 25 years, and uh, there's all kinds of different lasers in there. And the difference really comes to the rare earth element that's part of that laser. We're going to get into some of those mechanisms in a little bit of time just because it does make a difference. The most important thing, though, to remember is what are you trying to do? What is the goal? What is the focus? You can use lasers to coagulate. You can lose, use them to vaporize. You can use it to resect tissue. You can use it to enucleate tissue when we're talking about the BPH space. So essentially... What we're talking about here is various lasers. The first laser on the market was the neodymium YAG laser. That was kind of caused sloughing. When you look at the periodic table, um, you see it down here around 60, and you see the eutribium around 70. The two big lasers on the market, um, whether it's KTP, which halves that crystal, or when we talk about holmium and thumium laser, um, we'll get a little bit more into those details. It's important to know that holmium and thumium or only two electrons away on the periodic table, and that becomes important later. So when we talk about lasers, again, the most important thing to understand about lasers is their mechanism of action. The optical absorption is the most important component of lasers that drives the tissue interaction, how that photon interacts with the tissue. If that photon heats the tissue, below the boiling point, but high enough where protein starts to denature, you get a coagulation, and you get a delayed sloughing or a coagulation necrosis. If you heat that tissue above the boiling point of water, then you start to get vaporization, and you start to get that tissue completely going away. And you can look here at the different effects of the laser on tissue, whether it causes coagulation, denertion, or edema. So this is another example of what it looks like histologically. When you have that laser, you get that first layer of carbonization, then you get cellular vacuolization around that, and then you get tissue edema. And this also has to do with optical penetrance. So if tissue has a very high optical penetrance, the laser is not going to penetrate very tissue deeply in a tissue. If it's got a low penetrance, it's good, that tissue is going to be transparent, and those effects of the laser are going to be very deep. And that's important. So when we talk about coagulation, like I said, probably the first one used in urology, at least in the BPH space, was the neodymium YAG laser. Caused delayed sloughing. It was really a disaster. It penetrated tissue very deeply. That's back when we used to do V-laps and the old interstitial lasers where we'd stick the laser fiber in the tissue and turn it on to create those defects. This is more or less a historical variant because we really don't do too much of it anymore. When you look at it, again, it's the amount of time that lasers on a tissue. For a short exposure, you're going to get a short effect. For a long exposure, it is, you're going to get much more of a deep effect. So the technology is only one part of the equation. So you have lasers with different characteristics and different properties, but the way that they're used in the technique makes a big difference on what happens to your patient. Then that brings us, once we leave coagulation, to vaporization. These are contact lasers, and these can either be in contact with the tissue or near contact with the tissue. Almost any laser can provide a uh, vaporization of that particular tissue. The downside is once you vaporize that tissue, there's nothing there for histologic analysis. You're essentially debulking the tissue. The first whole app was actually done in uh, 1994 using a 60-watt laser. Now there's a 120-watt system, and we'll show some more details about that. 
the first PVP documented was in 2003. Actually, I was doing PVPs and, bagel, and beagles in the 90s uh, on um, using a 40 watt laser, and it was very slow and very painful. Now they have much higher power systems, the HPS and the XPS system, which we'll talk about briefly as well. When I think about lasers, I think about two different things in my mind, and this is how I break down all of BPH because I think about it simple. I think, what is my goal? Am I ablating tissue or am I enucleating tissue? And for me, that definition rests on ablation is debulking, really trying to destroy tissue. You're not removing all the tissue, but you're destructing that static component of BPH, de de obstructing that bladder neck to make it easier for patients to urinate. Whereas enucleation is completely, pro completely different. Open, simple prostatectomy, robot-assisted simple prostatectomy, Holmium laser enucleation, that's where you're actually removing all of that, all that transition zone to the peripheral zone, taking advantage of those embryologic planes to remove all of that treatment and then it's a permanent treatment with very low retreatment rates. <clears throat> so I'll start us off because it is early on a Sunday morning, the beginning of the work week here in Kuwait. <clears throat> I was giving this talk uh, down in Mexico a few months ago and I was talking all about the different lasers and things like that, and I had one of the gentlemen come up to me afterwards and said, it's really nice, you got those fancy lasers, but here we've got something just as easy that doesn't cost near as much. I saw this, and I'll take my lasers any day of the week compared to this particular way of dealing with uh, BPH. So, back to lasers. A again, when we think about this, and you think about lasers and soft tissue, it's important to understand how lasers work on stones. And when we talk about the laser effect of stones, there's two primary mechanisms of how those phot photons interact, either with inanimate stones or with tissue. There's either the photothermal effect or the photomechanical effect. And stones actually were driving the photothermal effect. Stones are filled with little crevices of urine and water. We superheat that water, it breaks the stone and causes lithotripsy. And it requires almost near contact with the laser to do that. The photomechanical effect is where that laser creates a vapor bubble and then that bubble collapses and you get a cavitation jet. If you think about it, the old Freddy dye laser, it was the double pulse dye laser, used to create those cavitation bubbles to break up stones, like a visual laser lithotripsy. The problem with that is the Freddy did not work well with calcium oxide, monohydrate stones, or hard stones. And you can do this in a non-contact mode. When we talk about the new modern lasers that are available to us in 2019, we have different parameters that control, that drive what we can do. So when you look at lasers, you can adjust the energy, which is the joules. You can adjust the frequency, or how quickly that energy comes out in terms of frequency. And now you can adjust the pulse width. And that gives us a lot of variability of how we treat stones, and there may be some applications of how we treat tissue as well. So when you look at this equation a little bit deeper and you get into what's the difference between frequency, power, all of those kind of things, when you increase the frequency or how that energy is delivered, when you use the lowest energy, you get the smallest fragments. You increase your energy, you're gonna get a bigger fragment when that photon interacts with that stone. But you decrease your retropulsion. Pulse duration is the newest thing on the block. And so when we talk about pulse duration, especially with holmium lasers, when you start to get that pulse, that allows the photons to pass to the end where you get your maximum pulse effect at the end of where that laser is. So you can see in this diagram with this acrylic phantom, they're getting a lot of photons right here at the acrylic because the photons will pass further through air than they will through the aqueous environment. And this is an example of the photomechanical effect where you get the cavitation bubble, you get the cavitation jet, but again, with stones, we're going after the photothermal effect. I would argue when we're doing homium enucleation, we're trying to drive the photomechanical effect more so than the photothermal effect, and I'll explain that. The other caveats of pulse width. When you have pulse width and you can adjust that, when you have short wavelengths, think of it as a jackhammer, you're gonna push that stone away. When you have a long pulse width, then your photons are in contact with that stone for a longer amount of time. The way that I think about it is I think about it painting with a paintbrush with long pulse widths or using a pencil for very precise dissection. When we're talking about soft tissue applications, 
there may be some advantages of doing the long pulse when you're trying to get hemostasis. So you want that long pulse, you want to brush with broad strokes, you want to get that collagen to cross link to get good hemostasis. Whereas if you're using the short pulse, that may be great to dissect because you're getting that cavitation jet. You're not getting a high thermal effect on that tissue and you're using the cavitation jet to do what I call hydrodissection to give you that plane during enucleation. Not all lasers are the same. This is an example of three different uh, lasers where you can see the KTP, you can see the Thumium, and then you can see the 980 diode laser. What you're seeing is you're seeing high optical density of the laser on tissue. You're seeing a lot of charring. That's where patients get their symptoms. That's where they get the frequency, the urgency, the burning. Anytime you start to see this discoloration, this, this is where you're starting to get those irritative symptoms. That's where it takes a long time for them to heal because you're actually inducing thermal damage on that tissue. When we talk about lasers, really we have to talk about where their wavelengths are because that drives their effect. The KTP laser is in the 532, so it's green. The 980 diode lasers are here in the red, but most of our lasers are in the infrared spectrum. And the reason they're in that infrared spectrum is for a very important physiological co consequence, and that's due to the relative absorption of that laser. So for example, the 532 is very good at being absorbed by the chromophobe hemoglobin over a million times more than water. You can see where those peaks cross and where the homium and the thumium, they're almost ideally situated at the peak optical absorption of water or urine. So what that does is that limits their tissue effect. These lasers will only penetrate about 0.4 millimeters in tissue. When you look at all the different laser platforms kind of compared, you can see the neodymium YAG, the homium YAG, you can look at their different wavelengths. The primary chromophobe, these ones that are highly absorbed by water provide us a lot of um, expertise and precision when we're dealing with soft tissue. The KTP, you can get some delay below what you can see tissue effects that may have consequences. And then the different applications you can use on your different lasers. So it's again, it's important to think about the goal that you're looking at. And what do I talk about? So a laser is what you see is what you get. When you have a green light laser and you've got red pigmented tissue, it's only gonna penetrate 0.8 millimeters. But if that tissue is unpenetrated, it may pen penetrate three millimeters. You may get a delayed sloughing until it hits that. You may get down to the neurovascular bundle if you're close to the capsule. The neodymium YAG is much worse, but at the homium laser, whether it's pigmented tissue or unpigmented tissue, it's only gonna penetrate 0.4 millimeters. And what that does is that gives you a high degree of precision. So, <clears throat> briefly, we've talked about a bunch of laser systems. Now, what's happening in 2012? It's alphabet soup. You name it, people are doing it with a laser. We started out with prostate ablation, PVPs, homium laser ablation, diode vaporization. Then we break it into enucleation. Typically, it's been homium laser enucleation. Then people are doing thumium enucleation. Now people are doing an offshoot procedure called laser vapo resection, which is actually going back in time. We started with the whole of doing homium laser resection of the prostate. Now people are using lasers to go backwards 30 years to do what we were doing a long time ago. You can do this with the thumium laser. You can do this with the green light laser. And so we have alphabet soup. How do we make sense of all these different things of what we can do? At the end of the day, it comes down to technique and what you're comfortable with and what's available to you. Just briefly, the diode lasers, they can come in assorted wavelengths. Some have multiple wavelengths. The nice thing about the diode lasers is that they're air-cooled, so they don't require a large power plant. They do not require liquid cool. It's got a small footprint, so you can use them in a lot of different places. You can go very high in energy. You can make them where they're continuous or pulsed. Um, and then they can have side fire fibers that can be contact. But you can see the way that these lasers work is really through contact and you get a lot of that tissue scar and a lot of that discoloration. People have a lot of delayed sloughing from that delayed thermal energy that I showed before. That edema and vacuolization sloughs that tissue down the road. So clinically, these have not really caught on very well. 
Then we get to the thumium laser, which has a wavelength of about 2110, continuous wave of energy, some molds or pulse, but for the most part, it's a continuous laser. The reason I don't like this for enucleation is because it is continuous. It will cut through any tissue. And again, when I'm dealing with soft tissue to try and do an enucleation, I'm going after that photomechanical element, not the photothermal. This will provide a very good photothermal, but not so much of the photomechanical. You can get high power on this, um, but again, you do tend to get a considerable char because you're getting constant photon interaction with that tissue. Then you get the PVP, the green light system. This is what I grew up uh, working with, with Dr. Malik at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, we started with a 40 watt system experimentally. Um, then there's the 120 watt HPS system and now the new 180 watt XPS system. The XPS system has to have this liquid moxie um, cooled fiber. Um, the advantage is they can take out twice the amount of tissue as the old system. So it's much more efficient at ablating. This is great if you want to spend a lot of money on a single only device. There's not much more you can do with this other than ablate. It's not really good for stones and the cost of these fibers is almost cost prohibitive. The fibers range anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500 per fiber and if it's a big prostate sometimes it takes more than one fiber to do it. But what data do we have? This is the Goliath trial. This was uh, designed as a non-inferiority trial with a two-year endpoint and the endpoint was the change in the international prostate um, symptom score. So this was uh, several different centers that all came together and they compared the new XPS system to a TERP and they wanted to say that this is not inferior. When you looked at the data, um, the IPS changes, their baseline after a year was pretty similar, maybe a little bit less in the TUR. Adverse events, a little bit higher in the green light system. Interesting that the irritative symptoms were only 18% versus 18% in the TERP. My experience with green light is they have a much higher incidence of irritative symptoms. And this is the 12 month data. The reintervention rate in the green light was 12% and in the TERP was 15%. Uh, baseline shim scores were pretty similar, um, but people always talk about homium laser nucleation and the temporary stress incontinence. I do point out that about 12% of those that underwent ablation had the same thing, and about 5% of uh, TERPs had the same thing. Um, one advantage is in the TERP, they did discover prostate cancer, but they didn't find any prostate cancer because there was no tissue. Now, certainly the catheterization time, return to health, hospitalization um, showed that the green light was favorable, but it is, was ultimately concluded to be not insufficient. Here's a patient that I saw, 67 year, 67 year old patient that underwent a PVP 18 months ago. When you, you look at retroflex view of the bladder neck, that's what you see with the uh, prostate tissue. I would say this is not a combination of the PVP. This doesn't mean the PVP failed, which it obviously did. I would say that this is a result of poor patient selection and bad technique. Way too big of a prostate, terrible technique, only ablated a little bit and left all of this. And so the problem continued to suffer. So what's new in terms of the other parts of uh, green light? Well, El, the late El Halali did a trial where he compared homium laser enucleation and he compared it to um, uh, XPS vapo enucleation. So he said, okay, I know how to enuclate. What's the difference if I use a green light to enuclate or a hole up to enuclate? They modeled their study on the Goliath as a non-inferiority study. Prostate sizes were pretty similar, 87 to 83. More men were sexually active in the enucleation group. More men were on blood thinners in the PVP group and more men were on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors in the PVP group. But when you looked at the outcome data, um, the length of stay was much higher in the PVP enucleation group. When you looked at the maximum flow rate, it was almost double in the whole up group compared to the PVP group. When you looked at the reduction in PSA, it was double in the homium laser enucleation group. When you looked at the reoperation rate, big differences there, no change in shim, and the conversion was much higher in the PVP group. Now you could attribute that to more of those men were on anticoagulations, and it actually turned out that the PVP was more expensive. This is likely due to the cost of the fibers. 
So what's new in the Holmium? This is the new Holmium 120, um, P120 system. The nice thing about this system over previous is that it's surgeon controlled. So you can have two different wavelengths, two different frequencies, two different pulse widths. You have the on and off at the top. Uh, you have this pulse width variation. The downside to this system is it's liquid cool. It has a very extensive liquid cooling system in it, so it runs on 50 amp service. Most ORs are not equipped to handle 50 amp service. Most ORs at the most are wired for 30 amp service. So be cognizant of your electrical supplies in your OR before producing this. One of the advantages of this particular device is it comes with a little add-on technology package called MOSIS. And what is MOSIS? This is essentially taking advantage of the physics. You're trying to maximize that bubble to get as many photons to travel through air to get to the end of that bubble as much as possible. This was introduced a couple years ago and it's found to be extremely effective for stone disease. So it cuts down on the retropulsion of stone disease. The long pulse width does the same thing, but this actually does it better. What does this require in terms of soft tissue and BPH? Where I use um, the Moses technique for um, soft tissue and BPH is I really use the short pulse because that gives me more photomechanical effect of separating that tissue with no thermal energy. And then I use the long pulse or the Moses technique for getting additional hemostasis. And what do those bubbles look like? So this is just a conventional homium laser at settings of one in 40. And you can see the normal bubble on short pulse where you can get that cavitation jet on lung pulse you can see that it's long and you're getting the energy there. What's interesting is you can see the moon from the sign here, a lot of the bubble dynamics get pushed back on your fiber. That's why you get fiber burn back. But when you look at the Moses technique, the bubble actually gets pushed out in front of the fiber so you get much less burn back. So you can see under the short pulse you get a worse cavitation kind of shape under all those pulses, but when you look at the long pulse, you get a longer bubble pushed out in front, so you're getting more photons at the tip of that bubble, so it becomes a more effective photothermal instrument. Where it's at in terms of photomechanical isn't as good, and we're still working on this. Lastly, I wanna to touch on some laser, new lasers that are coming out. These haven't hit the market yet. So this you have to understand a little bit about how lasers work. So low power lasers have the um, neodymium YAG crystal and it's doped with homium ions. You use a flash lamp, a xenon flash lamp to hit those electrons. They go to a higher energy state. When they come back down, they create photons that are reflected between mirrors and then it comes out through the tip of the fiber. This process is extremely wasteful. You get a lot of heat, so you need that uh, liquid cooler. For the high-powered homium lasers and the thumium lasers, you have four of these bricks, so to speak, that heat up and shoot out the uh, photons, and it does require this refrigeration system. The newest laser on the market is this thumium fiber laser, and this is different than the thumium laser, which again has a wavelength of 2110. This has a wavelength of 1940. The impressive part about this laser is it has a very long 30 meter silicon fiber and it's doped with thumium atoms. And they actually use diode lasers to power that electron shift in these atoms, which means that it can be air cooled, smaller footprint, air cooled. And what happens is you can get a very tight focus of this thumium energy. This is kind of optically tuned to that exact precision point of, the, of uh, water absorption. What does that mean from a laser physics standpoint? You can increase the frequency up to 2,000 hertz. Homium, you can't go above 80. You, studies have shown a 1.5 to 4 point to 4 time increase in the efficiency of breaking up stones with less retropulsion. That may be an advantage in stone disease. When you do increase that frequency, your irrigation temperature rises significantly. Again, where we talked about ureteral access sheets, this is gonna be more important to control the temperature of the upper tract down the road and maintaining that fluid turnover. But you can use smaller diameter fibers with the same delivery of energy and the soft tissue effects are under investigation. I've done several procedures with this, but I think that this is gonna have a role in stone disease. I'm not sure where it's gonna fit in BPH, but this is the newest laser to come out that you'll be hearing a lot about over the next couple of years. So in summary, when it comes to laser, you have choices. There's lots of different systems available. The key is to understanding how these different systems work and what your particular goal is. 
It's nice to have a multi-tool. It's nice to have that laser that can do stones, soft tissue, ablation, enucleation, stricture, scars. But at the end of the day, when it comes to all these lasers and things, technique trumps technology. If you're not using good technique, you're gonna have bad outcomes. So it's really important, like in all things surgery, to make sure you have good technique. Thank you very much.